upgrading materials and whether upgrading waste materials is that really a new idea and we'll go to the beast of the presentation today which is uh, nanocellulose and how do we convert nanocellulose into cellulose nanopapers and we use it as a reinforcement for polymers as well as utilizing nanocellulose to upgrade loose fibers to produce fiber bots. Uh, we'll probably we'll end with whether we actually need nanocellulose in general to create uh, renewable materials. So uh, heavy environment, environmental legislation uh, forces us uh, scientists to develop a new kind of materials that are recyclable or made entirely from renewable resources that could degrade on demand. More importantly, these materials should have the mechanical performance of commonly used engineering materials. So you have two ways of making these materials. Either you get a chemist, you chain the chemist next to his or her lab bench and force his or him or her to derive renewable polymers from plant-based resources, from renewable resources that actually have the mechanical performance of commonly used engineering materials, or you can take uh, commonly used materials uh, today, combine them in a clever fashion, combine them in a clever manner to create composite materials that actually is able to perform or even outperform uh, currently fossil derived uh, engineering materials. So all we are trying to do here is to feed towards a, a bioeconomy, a circular bioeconomy uh, model, right? So where you have biorefinery that actually takes biomass and your biorefinery actually converts this biomass to fuel, to electricity, to heat, as well as bio-based materials. So these bio-based materials, once it's at its end of life, you will uh, recycle or degrade them, compost them, produce a CO2, generate electricity, so on and so forth. You grow more trees to capture this carbon dioxide, and now you complete your circle. So this is a very simplistic view of a circular bioeconomy. What we are actually interested in is adding another loop into this uh, view. So in addition to your uh, conventional biomass, biorefinery, biofuel, bio-based materials, what we are proposing here is to take waste fibers, waste materials, and you combine them with a uh, bio-based materials to create materials that are very, very durable. So your waste fiber reinforced bio-based materials. And what we are aiming for is not to, to create materials that could uh, easily biodegradable. We actually want the durability in this case. Uh, at its end of life, instead of composting, digesting everything back to CO2, what we're interested in is to recycle these uh, durable uh, new materials back into its waste fibers, its original starting waste materials, and you create a second loop there, combining waste with bio-based materials again. Uh, and then ultimately, at the end of life, you decide to compost all these uh, bio-based materials and you can do so. Uh, and you, then you release the CO2 to the environment, you grow more trees. So the, the addition of a second loop allows us to buy time for the forestry industry to grow more trees, to actually capture more carbon, since uh, it is actually quite efficient to use trees to capture more carbon, right? Uh, and in our case, what we are interested in is to keep carbon in that materials loop, essentially using materials, durable materials, uh, for carbon capture and storage. So what we propose to do is to, to uh, use composite materials like we discussed earlier. So for the audience who are not familiar with composite materials, uh, composite materials is a uh, material made out of two or more distinct materials, typically made out of fibers, uh, where the fiber actually provide rigidity modulus, provide strength to the product. You, the fibers are encapsulated, surrounded by a polymer matrix, which actually protects the fibers, provide uh, a transverse properties as well as thermal properties. And the contact point between the uh, polymer matrix and the fiber is what we call the interface. Uh, and that actually uh, governs the overall load transfer as well as overall mechanical performance of the final composite. So the picture on the top right hand side corner actually shows uh, an image of a natural fiber reinforcing a thermoplastic polymer matrix uh, and the hole in between the fiber and the matrix is that interface. In this case, there's actually no interface so the ultimate performance of this uh, composite is actually rather poor. Uh, the picture on the top uh, center uh, top 
uh, shows an SCM image of a carbon fiber reinforced uh, polymer composite. You can actually see the fibers there. Now, creating uh, fiber reinforced polymers from waste materials uh, or for a circular bioeconomy is actually not a new concept. Uh, so this car was built uh, in a country that no longer exists, East Germany, back in 1957, right? So this is the Traban, and the body of this car is made out of cotton fiber reinforced phenolic resin. So, and the cotton fiber actually came from ex-Soviet Union military uniforms. So, so it is one, probably one of the first examples of how we develop renewable materials and probably one of the first uh, example of a first recycled car. And this car is very durable. Some uh, uh, sources suggest that the, 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 the car actually, well, the body of the car actually lasts more than 28 years. Uh, uh, and whereas nowadays, common car probably lasts about 10 years and you have to change, right? So what can we do now, now that, well, the concept of, of waste reinforced material actually has been generated, right? So let's go back to the drawing board and we look at wood. So wood actually is a natural composite materials uh, made out of cellulose reinforced lignin uh, compatibilized by hemicellulose. Right. So wood on its own as a structure uh, has a mechanical performance of 5 to 15 gigapascal in tensile modulus. So tensile modulus refers to the rigidity, the stiffness of the resulting material, and it has a strength of between 50 to 120 megapascals. So strength refers to how much load, how much force this material can sustain before it fracture. All right. So that is wood, 5 to 15 gigapascal. Uh, it's exciting, but not super exciting. But as you go further down to, to the constituent that builds wood, so all the way down to cellulose fiber. So at cellulose fiber length scale, this is actually where you do conventional pulping and you get your cellulose fiber to make paper, to make uh, other types of paper-based products. But you refine it further, you will actually get to uh, the bundles or cellulose fibrils down to what we call the cellulose microfibrils. Now, these are around 50 nanometers uh, or even smaller down to three nanometers depending on how you generate these cellulose nanofibrils but the, the, the performance of these fibrils are approximately 100 to 165 gigapascal in tensile modulus in terms of strength these nanocellulose essentially uh, is about 1.6 to 6 gigapascal now those values might not mean much but if you were to compare these numbers to conventional glass fibers so glass fibers has an elastic modulus, that E value of about 72 uh, gigapascal only. So these uh, nano uh, scale cellulose fibers are actually twice as stiff as a single glass fiber. The strength of these uh, nano cellulose fibers uh, are up to six gigapascal, whereas a conventional glass fiber is about three gigapascal. So there is actually quite a lot of potential in utilizing these uh, nano cellulose fibers, particularly around this length scale to uh, produce renewable materials. And, and for the rest of the presentation, we'll be focusing on that alone. Right, so a little bit of housekeeping here. So if you actually go to literature and try to search for nanocellulose, you're gonna get a lot of different terminologies, ranging from cellulose nanofibers to cellulose microfibrils, which for some reason it is a three nanometer uh, wide fiber. Uh, and we will use the terminology nanocellulose for the rest of the presentation today to refer to a family of cellulosic fibers in the nanometer scale, okay? And uh, you can actually make nanocellulose in, in, in two different ways, generally two different ways. If you start from wood, you get to the lignified pulp fibers, and you can then pass these uh, pulp fibers through either high pressure homogenizers, uh, an ultra fine grinder, or even a microfluidizer that produces uh, a jelly like uh, material, and that material is your nanocellulose. Uh, here's an SCM image on the bottom right corner. So it is uh, made out of these uh, nanofibrils uh, uh, of approximately, well, depending on how you run your uh, ultrafine grinder, it could range from 100 nanometers down to probably 20, 10, 20 nanometers or 10 nanometers or so. So 
uh, these wood derived nanocellulose in today's presentation, we shall call them cellulose microfibrils, uh, consistent with the terminology used in the forestry industry where they actually call wood derived nanocellulose, typically cellulose microfibrils in this particular case. Right, you can also make nanocellulose not from wood, but from sugar. So essentially, cellulose is polymerized sugar. It's a polyglucose, if you think about it. Uh, and bacteria does this more brilliantly than any other organisms, including humans uh, as well. So you have a bacteria from the cellulose, uh, cellulose producing bacteria, where you feed them uh, nutrients, typically sugar, glucose. Uh, the bacteria is happy swimming in this sugary syrup. Uh, they eat the sugar, they produce uh, an, a product for us. And that product looks like this uh, image on the top right hand corner. So that is a, a pellicle or a biofilm. If you take a closer look at that biofilm under high magnification, it is actually a fibrous network of approximately 50 nanometers in, uh, in fiber width and, and length, from a length scale perspective, it is rather continuous. The reason is because the bacteria eats the sugar, uh, producing this uh, nanocellulose for us. As, as bacteria grows, it undergoes mitosis. And in that case, uh, the bacteria actually would then split into, well, bacterium splits into two bacteria and the fiber actually splits at the same time. So the main difference uh, between nanocellulose produced by bacteria uh, and nanocellulose uh, from wood-based uh, resources is the, is the uh, purity. So bacterial cellulose is actually chemically pure cellulose without any traces of hemicellulose or lignin in it, whereas nanocellulose produced from wood typically consists a little bit of uh, hemicellulose, depending on the source, uh, and maybe traces of lignin. The uniformity of bacterial cellulose is governed by the genetic content of the bacteria, and therefore it always produces very uniform uh, nanocellulose of about 50 nanometers in diameter. And these nanocellulose are very, very crystalline, about 90% in degree of crystallinity. And for the, for the presentation today, uh, we shall call uh, these bacterial uh, this cellulose bacterial uh, cellulose for, 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 for today's presentation. Right. Every time when we present something about uh, bacterial cellulose, we always get a question whether bacterial cellulose is really commercially available. So wood, everyone can imagine that there's enough wood in the world for you to deconstruct uh, back down to, to uh, nanocellulose. Whereas in the context of uh, bacterial cellulose, uh, this actually is not uh, clear at all. In fact, bacterial cellulose is indeed commercially available and you can actually buy them from your, uh, from your local supermarket. So if you actually add Imperial College, for example, oops, if you actually at Imperial College, for example, you just need to go down to Old Scott, go towards uh, the, the uh, Thai supermarkets around there. You can get that product, that Nata de Coco. It is actually made uh, out of bacterial cellulose and it is actually quite tasty. If you don't want to spend one pound fifty buying a jar of uh, of jelly, what you could do is you can buy uh, the kombucha starter kit. You can actually grow this at home. So typically, uh, they would drink the kombucha tea and throw away the uh, bacterial cellulose floating on top. But that bacterial cellulose is essentially what we want. So bacterial cellulose is it is as commercially available as you would really like it to be. Now, uh, with all the different types of nanocellulose what can we make out of, what green materials can we make out of these nanocellulose? So our approach here uh, in my group here is actually rather simple. We focus very significantly on simple design. So we wanted to avoid crazy chemical modifications. We wanted to uh, avoid very, very complicated sample preparation uh, steps. We will always focus on manufacturability. Essentially any um, manufacturing steps to create our materials have to have an intrinsic scalable uh, aspect to it so that we can actually increase uh, the, the uptake of, our, of any of our invention. Uh, lastly, to make sure that uh, any nanocellulose-based products, nanocellulose-based renewable products uh, could actually go into, could actually penetrate the mass market. What we're looking for is you to use nanocellulose to achieve radical effects that conventional materials cannot achieve. And we'll discuss how we achieve all of these uh, design approaches here. Right, 
Uh, before we move on, let's talk a little bit about a, an interesting feature of cellulose or nanocellulose. So this uh, feature appears for both conventional cellulose-based pulp fibers as well as uh, nanocellulose. So uh, one, when you produce nanocellulose, whether if it's wood-based nanocellulose or, or um, bacterial-based bacterial cellulose, what happens is that when you dry them, uh, it actually turns it to a piece of cellulose nanopaper, so a piece of dried nanocellulose, right, which we call cellulose nanopaper. When you try to rehydrate them, it wouldn't go back to its original wet state. The morphology would, would not go back to the original state anymore. And this effect is what we call hornification. Yes, it is a paper, it's a technical term in the paper-based industry, which signifies the irreversible hydrogen bond uh, between uh, nanocellulose fibers when you remove water from, from, your, from your fiber network. So that actually is a big challenge in the field of nanocellulose because now if you wanted to utilize uh, nanocellulose, you have to find a way to make sure that it stays wet and as you uh, replace the water with something else, uh, it will then be able to create a product that, that is still uh, uh, has the right performance as engineering materials yet cheap enough to produce. Uh, what we actually uh, decide was that we think replacing water is a difficult process. So what we wanted to do was to make sure that our nanocellulose hornify significantly, creating what we call a cellulose nanopaper. So we utilize paper as our reinforcement. And the paper properties actually comes from the properties of the nanofiber themselves. Right, so Elba here actually spends her PhD studying this. So what she did was she take uh, wet nanocellulose. So here's a bacterial cellulose example. She, she uh, removed water by simple filtration uh, and then you press uh, to make sure that you squeeze all the water out at an elevated temperature to dry them. Essentially paper making, all right? You make a nice piece of uh, cellulose nanopaper. Uh, you then impregnate with a soybean oil resin uh, simple lamination is fine, and in this case, once you polymerize it, you actually get a piece of composite at the bottom left here, uh, and the composite actually is transparent, surprisingly. And uh, you actually see, you can see the SEM image of the uh, composite there, where you actually have the laminated structure with polymerized soybean oil on top and bottom, uh, and the center is actually your bacterial cellulose nanopaper. And looking at the radical effects here, so the cellulose nanopaper has a modulus uh, which refers to the left y-axis uh, characterized by that green uh, column, has a modulus about 20 gigapascal and a strength uh, which refers to the right y-axis uh, characterized by the purple circle there. Uh, of about 180 megapascal. So your conventional polymer is about four, up to four gigapascal in modulus, whereas nanopaper is 20 gigapascal, five times uh, stiffer. Conventional polymer ranges between 20 to 70 megapascal in strength, and, and this bacterial cellulose nanopaper has a strength of 180 megapascal. So soybean oil is a rather weak polymer resin. Uh, without any reinforcement, it has a modulus of only 0.4 gigapascal and a strength of four megapascal. So just adding 50% bacterial cellulose in this uh, laminated structure pushes the performance up, uh, performance of the composite up to a modulus of about seven and a half gigapascal and a strength of almost 100 megapascal. So just using nanopapers in a simple way, lamination, you upgrade the properties of a rather soft uh, soybean or plant-based uh, polymer up to something that's much more closer to an engineering polymer. And we don't really need to stick with just a single sheet of uh, bacterial cellulose nanopaper. And that's the uh, PhD thesis of, of Martin here. So what he did was to use polylactide and he stacks polylactide with various uh, number of layers of these uh, cellulose nanopapers. And you just stack and you heat press them. So rather simple, rather straightforward. So uh, what you see here are the different configurations of uh, composite being manufactured. So the key thing here is that the, non, the cellulose uh, grammage, so the amount of the mass of cellulose per unit area of the final material is kept constant at 50 grams per square meter. That means that you either have a single sheet of 50 grams per square meter nanopaper or 10 sheets of five grams per square meter nanopaper. You laminate them, 
press them together, produce a final uh, composite product. So you can almost see uh, the, the morphology or well, the physical structure of, of the nano papers here. So five grams is actually like a piece of tissue paper and 50 grams is much more closer to a piece of your writing paper. Right, so from an SCM perspective, you look at the morphology. So your 50 grams paper, it is a, a, a laminated structure with, uh, with your nano paper at the center uh, and your polylactate on, on the outside laminating it. Uh, even for your five, 10 sheets of five grams per square meter, uh, five GSM nanopapers, the nanopaper still uh, preserves its nanopaper structure. You would imagine that as such a, a thin nanopaper, when you press them, the, the PLA would impregnate into the nanopaper network. Uh, but it turns out that it's not the case. This is because these uh, nanopapers uh, or these papers made out of nanocellulose are very, very tight. So the permeability is almost non-existent in, in this case. But that's actually good for us because if it's so tight, you actually create very stiff and very strong uh, nanopaper that you can actually utilize the nanopaper as the reinforcing structure for your materials at the end of the day. So if you look at the tensile properties of the resulting composite, so again, the left y-axis shows the tensile modulus and the right y-axis shows the tensile strength. Modulus is in the green columns, strength is in the uh, purple icons. So polyelectric acid, just about uh, four gigapascal in modulus and about 60 megapascal in strength. Adding uh, nanocellulose in any shape, size, or form at about 40 to 50 percent by weight, you would be able to push the performance up to about 10 gigapascal in modulus, about 100 megapascal in strength. So the beauty of this process actually is that instead of creating a very thin film, now you can find ways to stack these nanopapers up to by as much as you want to, creating structure that's three millimeters thick, six millimeters thick, nine millimeters thick. We are no longer limited to just 100, micro, 100 micrometer thick uh, composite film that, that tends to be the norm in the composite, in, in the nanocellulose composite industry. Right, uh, just moving away a little bit from a renewable materials perspective. So Daniela here actually turned these nanopapers into a transparent film, which then laminate with an impact modified acrylic resin to create a transparent three millimeter thick structure that is actually useful for impact protection. So conventional PMMA has a certain impact strength of about six kilojoules per square meter. You modify the PMMA to make sure that it becomes impact modified. You increase the impact strength to about 12 uh, kilojoules per square meter. Putting this cellulose standard paper into the structure pushes the impact strength up by 60% relative to impact modified acrylic. So just with this nano paper alone, it's not really useful just in the renewable materials industry, but also in, in these sort of high performance uh, engineering uh, materials. Right, so we have been talking about using nano cellulose to upgrade existing materials. What can we do with upgrading waste materials, right? So what we have here is loose sizal fibers. Uh, and you can actually add a little bit of uh, nanocellulose uh, and sizal fibers together in a dispersion. Uh, you stir them up, you remove the water by filtration, you take the filter cake, you press them at 60 degrees Celsius, and this essentially based on a paper making process, you actually create a rigid sizal fiber board without any polymers uh, needed apart from nanocellulose and the sizal fibers themselves. So the Pictures on the right doesn't do uh, the technology justice because it, it's, it's quite, it, you cannot see how rigid it is. So we devised a rather simple three-point bending process. So top two pictures, no bacterial cellulose. Bottom two pictures, 10% bacterial cellulose. Uh, so the, the, pre, the, the fiber board uh, that has no bacterial cellulose, you put a, a plastic cup on top, yeah, it has a bit of weight, it still sustains its, its shape. With a little bit of water, you can see how much it deforms by because there's no rigidity towards the fiber, the fiber board. With bacterial cellulose, on the other hand, you can add water to this plastic cup and it doesn't even deform. In, in fact, you can actually put a pint of beer on top of that fiber board and nothing ever happens. So that's how rigid it is. And we can actually scale this up to a rather big preform. So this is a 30 centimeter by 30 centimeter preform, 1600 grams per square meter. 10% bacterial cellulose, 90% loose sizal fibers. You stir, you filter, you press, you get that uh, fiber board. Uh, and Jing here actually holds it only at the bottom of that heavy fiber board and it doesn't even deform, right? If you have a conventional uh, woven, non-woven uh, fabric, 
it's just going to deform automatically under its own weight. So that actually shows you how rigid this fiberboard is. So why does it work? So if you take a close look at the microstructure of the pre of the fiberboard here, uh, you can see your sizal fibers, and in between all these sizal fibers, you actually get a network of, in this case, bacterial cellulose uh, on the bottom left uh, corner there. So, so that bacterial cellulose actually sticks to the surface of sizal fibers, and the bacterial cellulose themselves then fornify and form a fiber network, or essentially a piece of paper if you think about it, and that binds the whole structure together. So if we look at the tensile index of the material, so again, we, we switch from tensile strength to tensile index because these fiber preforms don't have a defined area. So the conventional uh, uh, way of, uh, of quantifying will be using tensile index in this case. So uh, the force required to fracture the material per unit width of the sample. So no bacterial cellulose, we couldn't actually measure any tensile uh, index. With 10%, we actually obtain a tensile index of approximately uh, 12 and a half kilonewtons per, square, per meter. So the rigidity actually stems from bacterial cellulose. No rigidity, uh, no bacterial cellulose, no rigidity in the final uh, preform themselves. Right. So we then take these uh, fiberboard or preform, we impregnate them with our friend soybean oil. We polymerize it. At 40% uh, loading, we actually create a composite uh, bacterial cellulose enhanced sizal fiber reinforced soybean oil composite. So the bottom left graph shows you the tensile modulus, essentially rigidity. The bottom right shows the tensile strength, how strong it is. So uh, with sizal fibers alone, it is actually a useful reinforcing fiber. You can actually increase the modulus by six times relative to, uh, to soybean oil. That addition of a little bit of bacterial cellulose increased the modulus further uh, relative to just sizal fibers alone, up to six gigapascal in terms of uh, tensile modulus. In terms of strength, using sizal fibers alone increases the uh, properties of sorbine oil by three times. <clears throat> And the addition of uh, that bacterial cellulose actually pushes the performance of your tensile, uh, performance of your composite up to about 30 megapascal. So having that, back, that nanocellulose within your uh, conventional fiber reinforced polymer creating, that allows you to create much stronger, much stiffer uh, renewable composites. So the, you might ask, right, okay, if, if we all rely on uh, hornification, why can't we do the same for paper with pulp? Pulp actually will hornify, turn itself into paper. So this is where Martha did all her PhD on. So if you take a look at the samples that she has made with different types of cellulose, so you have bacterial cellulose, would derive nanocellulose, uh, nanocellulose in the context of cellulose microfibrils and pulp, you actually need the nanocellulose to create a uh, fiber board that is stiff and strong. With just pulp fibers alone, it just wouldn't bind the materials together. The reason is because of the, of, of, uh, of the surface area. So nanocellulose has higher surface area. So more surface area, more coverage covering the, in this case, uh, the flex fibers, or Martha did flex fibers, covering the flex fibers. And more surface area means that there are actually more uh, contact points between the nanocellulose fibers. More contact points mean more hydrogen bond. More hydrogen bond means more rigid structure. Pulp fibers are bigger, 20 microns in, in fiber width. So you have a smaller surface area, smaller surface area, uh, smaller uh, coverage of, of the flex fibers. So, uh, smaller flex fiber coverage uh, means also that you have uh, less contact points between the different fibers and therefore weaker uh, fiberboard performance. Uh, so one of the designers came to us about five years ago and said they really like this technology. Can they do something about it? Which I then said, yes, we taught him everything. And he went back to Taiwan and create very expensive art pieces in his uh, uh, studio. So renewable waste uh, fiber reinforced, uh, waste fiber speaker cones made from uh, bacterial cellulose and, and uh, waste fibers. Uh, interior boards, as well as these design art pieces, I think this center piece is actually wood fiber, and that piece here I think is uh, materials from your denim, I believe. Right, so do we have to limit ourselves just to natural fibers? What about other types of waste? So for example, chicken feathers. So uh, one of my students, Elena, actually founded Arrow Powder, whose mission is to turn chicken feathers into useful, higher value products. One of the products is her company commercialized is uh, Plumo, essentially a, a 
thermal insulation using chicken feathers. Uh, and considering the fact that we are producing 3.5 mil 3.1 million tons of feathers every year, what else can we do to utilize these feathers? And this is where our uh, nanocellulose binding technology actually comes into play. And Victoria spends about six months uh, working on this uh, topic. So natural fibers are hydrophilic. So cellulose sticks to it uh, beautifully and, and then form that rigid fiber board. But chicken feathers are fluffy and they are actually hydrophobic. So if you try and disperse chicken feathers in water, it will float all the way to the top. So no uniform dispersion, no fiber board. So what Victoria did was to then convert uh, the dispersing medium from pure 100% water to water, 50% water, 50% isopropyl alcohol, right? So we start with feathers, we blend them in uh, water uh, isopropanol uh, solution. You filter them, you take out your filter kit, you press them, you create this uh, chicken feather fiber board, if you will. So she tried pulp fibers at 10% pulp, just there's not enough to cover all the fibers uh, to form a useful preform uh, or fiber board. Whereas at 20% pulp, you can actually get something out of it. But the best results actually came from wood derived nanocellulose, so uh, cellulose microfibrils here. You can actually uh, obtain a tensile index of about one and a half kilonewtons per meter with, uh, with uh, nanocellulose here in this case. Uh, and this actually is about five times increased relative to uh, pulp themselves. So why does it work? So now that we know that cellulose uh, is hydro, uh, natural fibers is hydrophilic, but chicken feathers are not. So why does it work in this particular context? So here's a morphology where it's showing uh, the, the nanocellulose as well as the exposed area of your uh, feathers, so the bark of the feather. So it looks like it's actually quite bare and quite, uh, there's no good adhesion between the nanocellulose and the, the uh, chicken feathers. So this led, uh, led us to hypothesize that actually the preform works by actually encapsulate the nanocellulose, encapsulating like a pouch, ca capturing, uh, trapping, the chicken feathers instead of binding onto chicken feathers, which then uh, the nanocellulose binds to other nanocellulose to form a, a rigid fiber preform. So the mechanism is slightly different, but it does work for uh, hydrophobic materials like a chicken feather, for example. Uh, so Victoria then went on to, to turn these uh, fiber board into composites by using gelatin as the polymer matrix. So what, he, what she did here was uh, taking uh, the produced fiber board, she impregnated with a gelatin solution, you evaporate off the water, leaving uh, forming now a feather gelatin composite, which actually has a modulus of approximately one to two gigapascal, a strength of 10 to 20 megapascal. Not entirely super strong, super stiff, but it's a good start. The interesting thing about this composite is that it is water soluble, actually hot water soluble. So what you could do is you just dump your composite in hot water. Uh, it dissolves away the gelatin. And if you actually recover the, the gelatin solution, you can freeze dry them, get your gelatin back, and you can then go on and create uh, another feather gelatin composite. And your, fiber, your, fiber, your chicken feathers, you can actually recover them, dry them, and again, you can reuse them again in your feather uh, gelatin composite. So essentially closing the loop, right? So you create a material that will last for as long as it needs to uh, for any given applications. You dissolve away, recovering the raw materials, uh, and then you continue and then go to your next manufacturing site, create the materials in any shape, size, and form that you want that is useful for that particular application and then use it, dissolve it, and start over. Right, so I have been focusing a lot on nanocellulose, but do we actually need nanocellulose? Why can't we use paper? Since uh, we have been using paper for uh, as a reinforce, reinforcement uh, since the 20s and 30s. So this is uh, where Jana started her PhD on. So she challenged the conventional wisdom that we actually don't need nanocellulose. All we need is to make sure that we have enough uh, uh, cellulose fibrils in our structure, and that's it. So if you recall, the way that you make nanocellulose is that you take wood, you delignify them, you then convert them to pulp, and then you uh, shear or you, you fibrillate the whole thing all the way to a, a nanoscale fibers. What if we stop halfway? So this is actually where Jana started a PhD. So you take your conventional pulp fiber, you pass it through a colloid mill, 
until you get your uh, you liberate off some of the of some of the microfibers on the pulp fiber surface, creating what we call hairy fibers. Uh, and you don't want to go all the way actually in the conventional colloid mill, you just couldn't go all the way to nanocellulose anyway. So what can we do with this hairy fibers? So you can make a paper board and these liberated surface microfibrils actually will fill in the gaps in between the, the, the uh, pulp fibers. And, and now that reduce your porosity of your paper board as well as uh, reduce the permeability of the paper board itself. So for samples that we find, for 30 minutes before you turn them into a paper board, this hairy pulp, uh, hairy pulp fiber paper board has a porosity of only 20% compared to uh, unrefined ones of 47%. And it has a permeability, uh, it will require more than 38,000 seconds to pass a volume of air through the sample under a given differential pressure. Whereas for those refined for zero minutes, only you need 17 seconds to pass a given volume of air through. And these samples also have decreased uh, oxygen transmission rates. The sad thing is that this technology doesn't allow us to create uh, uh, hydrophobic materials because these are still cellulose, so the, wa the water vapor transmission rate didn't change at all. In terms of the tensile performance, so your green dots uh, represent the tensile modulus, the blue ones represent the tensile strength. Uh, increasing refining time increases both tensile modulus and strength of the resulting paper board. Uh, and this is because now you actually have more of these uh, hairy fibers. What it does is actually it binds, uh, it have more surface area, which then binds uh, adjacent pulp fibers together in a much more tighter, stronger fashion through honification, creating a much more rigid paper board. Uh, so the other project that I wanted to talk about is uh, upgrading engineering plastics. So the UK is now moving towards uh, the use of more recycled materials. So recent, uh, plastic packaging tax forces the, the manufacturers to have at least 30% recycled content in your plastic packaging. If not, you'll be taxed 200 uh, pounds per ton. Uh, yes, if you can actually separate out the plastics, uh, that would be great. But in many cases, uh, these recycled plastics are still quite contaminated. More importantly, there's another stream of product called mixed plastics, which is actually shown in the bottom left corner. So these ones that cannot be recycled, cannot be separated successfully, and these are made out of a wide range of uh, plastics. In this particular batch here, you have ABS, you have polypropylene, polystyrene, and polyethylene. Now you might think, well, okay, I just need to melt them together, uh, then mold into any shape and it should work. Actually, it doesn't work that way. Polymers inherently don't like to mix with each other. So you, you actually get polymers that phase separates. You might ask, well, phase separation, so what? So the main issue is phase separated polymers uh, from these recycled mixed plastics has very, very poor mechanical performance. So on the left graph that we show the tensile modulus and the right tensile strength of virgin polypropylene, virgin high density polyethylene, virgin ABS and virgin polystyrene, along with the properties of the mixed engineering plastics that we characterize. In the context of uh, modulus, it's two and a half gigapascal. So not the best, not the worst. It looks decent. In terms of strength, on the other hand, it's only 20 megapascal. And your other engineering plastics like ABS, for example, it's, uh, it's 40 megapascal, so 100% higher than mixed engineering plastics. But the worst thing that's not shown on this data is your strain at failure. So how much a sample can elongate before it breaks, before it fractures. In the case of polypropylene, 500%. High density polyethylene, 400%. So it will stretch 400% before it fractures. Uh, mixed engineering plastic, 0.9% uh, because of the poor microstructure, the phase separation. So it stretches by 0.9% and the host material will fracture itself. So that's actually not very useful if you want to use this for, for various applications. That brittleness is not good enough. So what do we do? Cellulose fibers, specifically rayon fibers. So you have wood that goes to pulp fibers or dissolving pulp in this particular case. Instead of turning them into paper, you turn dissolving pulp uh, you dissolve dissolving pulp into a cellular solution which you then spin. You can dissolve through the NMMO process or the viscose rayon process, you spin into this synthetic cellulose fibers. So what Grace did here along with Wen Zi is that uh, they actually created this non-woven rayon fibers. The reason we're interested in rayon fibers is because these fibers are very ductile, about 12% strain and failure. 
they entangle up nicely as well. So in addition to the fibers being ductile, the fiber network itself is also rather ductile. So just laminating these very brittle uh, mixed engineering plastics with a, a rayon non-woven fiber mat, we can actually increase the impact strength from 3.45 kilojoules per square meter to almost 9.59 uh, kilojoules per square meter. Right? So that is a 180% increase in impact strength. And this is only just 4 weight percent non-woven uh, rayon fiber within the structure. So this is still very early uh, experimental data. So there is actually a lot more work being done by Grace to finish off all this uh, experimental characterization. So to quickly sum up, uh, cellulose uh, will actually allow us to develop better renewable materials. You can have uh, the ones coming from bacteria or the ones coming from wood. In, you can actually uh, consolidate these uh, nanocellulose into a piece of nano paper uh, and use it as a reinforcement to upgrade and, uh, and existing materials. Or you can use it to use the hornification effect to bind loose fibers together, forming rigid fiber board, which then actually has a, a function for, for uh, various uh, engineering applications. If you don't like, don't like nanocellulose, that's fine. You can start with pulp fibers. You can mechanically refine them to create hairy fibers. Uh, that allows you to create a paper board that has a reduced permeability and oxygen transmission rates. And last but not least, while we can actually we like to wear synthetic cellulose uh, fiber-based uh, clothing, it is actually a useful material for us to create or upgrade the properties of waste materials, uh, mainly through increased ductility of the final product. Uh, with that, I would like to end my presentation. So I would like to thank all the funders who funded all the work presented in this uh, presentation, and as well as the people who are actually listening to my presentation today. Thank you very much. Right, so I believe I can need to go to Q&A. <clears throat> uh, so there's a question from uh, MS here. So why does polyazo have such poor baseline performance? So uh, polyazo, uh, it has such a poor baseline performance mainly because the chain is very, very long and the number of uh, uh, double bonds within that polymer chain is not enough to create a highly cross-link structure. So you would have very long uncross-link polymer chain and, and because you don't have enough cross-linking points, the mechanical performance of the resulting polyazo is rather weak in this particular context. Uh, this next question is what other candidate renewable resin are able re, are able to perform better? So in this context, a PLA, polylactic acid, should be the best performing commercially available uh, polymer, uh, well, biodegradable and bio-derived polymer. Uh, obviously, you can look at uh, different types of PHBVs, uh, even cellulose acetate, cellulose acetate butyrate as well. These are also very useful uh, engineering polymers which are bio-derived. Uh, or, or are they more subtle matrix requirements for maximizing performance? For maximizing uh, performance in the context of a composite setting, it does actually depend on what performance you're looking for. So if you're looking for something that would have durability, so you would actually want to uh, develop a biodegradable or bio-based polymer that actually uh, can, can sustain high impact loading. So in this context, PLA is a brittle polymer, so it might not work uh, amazingly. Uh, or, uh, so we have another question here. Can we scale now to replace polypropylene packaging snacks uh, as PP is non-recycled? Uh, non -recyclable? So for the case of nanocellulose, the answer is potentially yes. So there are a lot of companies, uh, big comp paper, paper manufacturers in the world are now making nanocellulose and nanocellulose-based packaging products. So uh, the likes of SAPI, the likes of uh, Lensing uh, and, and, and other big name manufacturers, they are trying to explore what can you do with nanocellulose, particularly with paper packaging, uh, with uh, packaging. So I believe Finland VTT actually created one of the first prototype of uh, nanocellulose-based packaging. Uh, the only downside is it actually wasn't transparent, but uh, I think given enough tech time uh, for this technology, it will probably work. Right. Uh, I think that's all the question. 
I have. Thank you very much. Um,